One of the gals was having a tough time with a physical comedy. She was only 17, maybe she weighed 100 pounds, she was five feet tall. Well, this little slip of a thing let it be known that she was hoping to find a new partner. Rena Arnold knew that Billy Lorraine and I were splitting up, so she told the girl. She said, try to team up with Billy Lorraine. He's the real talent of the two. <laughs> so one night I'm hanging around backstage after our last show, and I'm approached by this petite Irish girl. She had long, lustrous hair with natural curls that hung down onto her shoulder. Her skin was that, the, that, 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 that Irish peach bloom. Hardly any makeup, no lipstick. I look down at her and I'm thinking I want to say something smart, something clever, something sophisticated. So I came up with, hello. <laughs> she looked at me and she said, I understand you're looking for a new partner. Her voice. Her voice was unforgettable. Unforgettable. It was like a little bird's. The kind of voice that would carry all the way to the back of a crowded theater without having to be raised. I remember looking down into her eyes. One was green, the other blue. I thought, what a lovely girl this is. Her name was Grace Ethel Cecile Rosalie Allen. Born and raised in San Francisco, she was the youngest of five Irish Catholic girls. Their father was a, a clog dancer in vaudeville. They were all part of the act. Grace made a debut on stage when she was three, doing an Irish jig, and hadn't been off the stage ever since. Grace would say something funny and, and act as if she didn't know it was funny. Look at me, and that would make the audience laugh. I'd look at my cigar, then look at the audience as if to say, did you hear the same thing I heard? Then laugh again. When the laughs died down, I looked back at Gracie, she'd still be looking at me. As far as she knew, we were having a private conversation. And that was Burns and Allen. She was simply the dizziest girl in the world. What made her so original was that she acted as if everything she said made perfect sense. She said she put salt in the pepper shaker and pepper in the salt shaker, so if she made a mistake, she'd be right. <laughs> I told her I was getting 4% of my money at the bank. She said she was getting 8%. I said, how'd you manage that? She said, I keep my money in two bags. <laughs> she said she was never going to make egg salad again. I said, why not? She said she knew that egg salad was made from eggs and mayonnaise. But when she looked on the label on the jar of mayonnaise, and said it was made from eggs. So why bother? <laughs> You couldn't argue with Gracie's logic, illogical logic. She said it was harder for actors to act in movies than it was to act on stage because movie stars had to learn how to act in black and white. <laughs> I took her to a coffee shop. She asked the waiter if all the entrees came with dessert. He said, yes, they do. So she ordered blueberry pie and said, bring us all the entrees. <laughs> Gracie never liked telling jokes. So at one point, Jack said, Gracie, tell us a joke. She said she didn't know any. Well, isn't that something coming from the funniest person I'd ever worked with? And Jack said, come on, Gracie, you must surely know at least one Irish joke. And Gracie thought for a moment. She said, oh, I just remembered one. She said, two Irishmen walked out of a bar. <laughs> We were best friends, but I have to admit there was, there was something that continually annoyed me about Jack. His violin playing. <laughs> You've got to understand that Jack Benny was to playing the violin what Babe Ruth was to playing the violin. <laughs> One day John D. Rockefeller called Jack. He said, Mr. Benny, I'll pay you $5,000 if you come to my house and play a medley of love songs on your violin instead of playing at the Palace Theater tonight. And Jack said, what's the occasion? Rockefeller said, no occasion. It's just that I'm going to the Palace Theater tonight. <laughs> there was 
some nights that Jack would do a show and not play one single note on his violin. But he always carried it on stage with him, holding on to it for dear life. One night, a couple of seconds before he was due on stage, he couldn't find the violin. He started to panic. We all started looking for it. I said, no, what are you worried about, Jack? Just go on stage without it. You don't need the violin. Reluctantly, Jack went on stage and suddenly didn't know what to do with his hands. So he did this. <laughs> and he did this. And he did this. And that was the beginning of the trademark Jack Benny hand gestures. All because I hid his violin. <laughs> I understand your sister Mabel has got a job in a lingerie factory. That's right, George. She's a diesel fitter. A diesel fitter in a lingerie factory? Uh-huh. She's the one that holds up the underwear and says, Yup, diesel fitter, diesel fitter. <laughs> and just one year after that... Maxwell House Coffee proudly presents The Burns and Allen Show. Also featured on tonight's program is Guy Lombardo and his orchestra. Well, Gracie, here we are with our very own radio show. People from all over the country will be tuning in to hear us, just like they do for Jack Benny. I've never heard Jack Benny's program. You've never heard it? Why is that? Well, one time I turned on the radio and Jack Benny's program was just over. The announcer said, tune in next week, same time, same station for the Jack Benny show. So I tuned in the very next week, same time, same station, and the show was over again. And at the end of the show, I said, say goodnight, Gracie. <laughs> 